Genesis chapter 19. Uh, we won't get very far this evening, but that's okay. As Lord willing, there's always next week. So uh, let me do a quick recap. As we were talking about last week, we were talking about Sodom, and God was bringing judgment upon Sodom for their sin. And we were seeing how sin corrupts. If you remember our discussion last week, we were talking about uh, the practices of the men of Sodom had become normalized in their minds uh, or, or in their actions because they had already normalized sins in their hearts and minds. And anytime sin becomes normalized in your hearts and in your mind, uh, it will affect the way that you live. It will mean your practicing of sin is normalized to you. So they, they thought that gang rape was essentially the exact same thing in their minds as the love expressed between a man and woman in a monogamous, loving marriage relationship. That's how corrupt the people of Sodom had become. And as we were concluding last week, we were talking about Lot and how he's this very complicated character who, uh, who appears righteous, and the Bible even describes him as righteous, and yet Lot is not sinless. He's called righteous, but he's not sinless. He struggles a lot. And, and as we can see here, I'll try to back this up so that everybody can see this, but uh, we, we see just a quick little illustration of Lot's descent into sin because we see that in Genesis 13, he starts off, he's living with Abram. He's part of that family there, the covenant family, and he's knowing who God is. But then he separates from Abram and he begins to live near Sodom. You remember it said that he camped near Sodom. And then, continuing to Genesis 14, it says that he's now living in Sodom. So he, with Abraham, moves away near Sodom, doesn't even remain there long. He's living in Sodom. Then, uh, Genesis 19, 1, we learn that he becomes an important person in Sodom because he's sitting in the gate. That's where the elders of the city would sit. That's where the judges would sit. That's where the most important people would sit. And that's where Lot's sitting. So he's risen to prominence within this sinful, corrupt city. And then we see that he, in Genesis 19, 7, considers uh, the Sodomites his brothers. He says, brothers, don't do this horrible thing. And so they're like family to him. This is how Lot has just you know, descended deeper and deeper into sin. There's one final step here. Um, we're not going to get there this evening. <laughs> I thought we might, but that'll be next Wednesday. One final step, because Lot is going to have this last sinful action that we see with him and his two daughters, and it is disgusting. So with that in mind, we, we were considering last week how sin corrupts people, the corruption of sin, and this week what we're going to see is the destruction of sin. We're going to see how much God truly hates sin. So if you have your Bibles open, we're going to read uh, Genesis chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 10 through 14 to start off with. The Bible says, but then the men reached out. So this is referring to the angels here, actually. So then the angels reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they uh, struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, uh, both uh, small and great, so that they uh, wore themselves out groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, daughters, uh, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in this city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against it uh, has uh, gone out, or the outcry against it, against his people, has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. We'll stop there for the time being. Actually, no, continue verse 14. So Lot went out and said to his sons in law, who were to marry his daughters, Get up out of this place, uh, for the Lord is about to destroy the city, but he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, but I'm just going to mention three things in passing very quickly. Something I want to draw your attention to first is I want you to notice uh, this scene where the angels strike the sodomites with blindness and they're groping at the door. Uh, it's, this is picture of blind sinners groping after sin. I mean, just imagine this. We read by this pretty quickly. But what, are the, what is their heart set on in this moment? Sinful act. Gang rape. That's exactly what they're wanting to participate in. And when they're struck with blindness, that doesn't end it for them. They're like, oh, well, you know, good move. We didn't realize you could do that. We're going to go home. They start groping at the door. This is like an insatiable desire 
for sin. And I want you to see how it relates to sinners today and how sinners live. Unrepentant, heathen sinners who have not turned from their sins, who have not trusted in God. The Bible says, in fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. The, the sinners are blind today. Their minds have been blinded just as the Sodomites had been blinded and sinners today are still groping after sin in the same way that the Sodomites were. They were groping after the door trying to do anything they can to, to satiate that desire for sin and here you have sinners today living completely in contrast to the ways of the Lord who have no desire to love the Lord who reject the gospel entirely. Their minds have been blinded by the God of this world, and yet they still grope after sin, do everything they can to satisfy that desire that they have for sin. It's something that we still see uh, to this very day. And uh, another thing I want you to notice here in just these few verses, uh, we could make this lot uh, another step. I mean, this ladder for a lot could just keep going down. I was trying to pick some you know, key moments, but... But notice that Lot was going to let his daughters marry men from Sodom. The Bible clearly said that all the men of Sodom were corrupt, every last one of them, and yet Lot, who was supposed to be this righteous guy, was going to let his daughters marry Sodomites. He had given them to them to, to be betrothed in marriage. That is horrible. I mean, it's absolutely despicable. Lot, his first and primary responsibility is to his wife and his children. He's already betrayed his family once because when the men were groping and trying to say, hey, let us have those angels, Lot literally said, hold on, brothers, don't do this. I've got two daughters, and you can do with them what you please. It's what he literally said to them. He's supposed to be this righteous man, and yet he was betraying his own family. He's supposed to be his primary responsibility to his wife and his children, and yet he's offering his only daughters to the Sodomites to do whatever they want to them in order to protect these strangers. And then here he, we learn that he was... He did, but that... He did, uh, I, I believe so at least. Uh, he knew that they were from God. I mean, he, they even told him, you know, that, that God was going to destroy the city and things like that. Even if they were angels, if someone came, you know, if some people were trying to knock on my door, say, hey, give us Anna, and I was hiding some angels, I'd say, you can have the angels. I do not care. I will do whatever it takes to protect my wife. That's my primary responsibility. That's the biblical ladder. Uh, or you can talk about hierarchy. It's God first, then your spouse, then your children, your family, and then everybody else. I love my wife more than I love my son. Didn't even think it was possible, but I do. That's his responsibility, and he is betraying his family here, and he was going to give them in marriage. Now, some of you have daughters. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it would be like, it would be like a, a long hair, it would be like a, a long hair, man bun having, tattooed arm, person coming to you and saying, can I, well, may, maybe it's not that exact, that exact example, but, uh, but could you imagine giving your daughters in marriage to people like this? I mean, this is absolutely despicable behavior, and it shows how much Sodom has changed Lot. And people want to act like, and this is what gets me, people want to say, well, you know, I can be around sin and not sin myself. That's one of my talents, you know. I, I want to volunteer to go to the strip club ministry because I'm not tempted by that. So sign me up, I'll go. It's for the sake of the gospel and for the expansion of the kingdom, so I'm just not tempted in that way. And people think that they can just indulge or be around sin but not participate at first, and somehow they're just not going to be affected by it at all. Um, you all know if you hold a, a match right here and you say, look, it's not burning me, it's not burning me, it's eventually going to burn you, right? It's what happens. You play with fire, you're going to get burned, and we see that happening in the, the life of Lot here. And then the, the last thing I want you to just see in just these few verses is uh, notice that the people don't believe the message about impending judgment. Lot goes to his sons-in-law, and he says, you have to get up. Something bad is about to happen. The whole city is going to be destroyed. Uh, God is bringing this place down. Fire and brimstone are coming. And, and how do they respond? They, 
they're basically laughing at him. They, they, it seemed to them that he was jesting, is what the Bible says. It, it gives the idea that they were probably laughing, like, oh, this is just Lot. He's hilarious, you know, listen to him doing that. But think about how serious of a situation this is. I mean, God's wrath in judgment is literally about to come upon this place to destroy the whole city, and they think it's funny and that he is joking. And, and so Lot kind of finds himself in the same line as someone like, can you think of another biblical character we've already seen so far who was in a, a similar situation? Noah. Who said it? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, Noah. Uh, Noah did this same thing. God said, hey, I'm going to flood the entire earth. Uh, no one's going to be saved except those who come upon this ark. And the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, and then 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, that Noah went about preaching to these people, that he was a herald of righteousness or a preacher of righteousness, as the Bible calls him. And so Noah went and told people, God is going to send a flood upon the earth. God's going to, you know, destroy this whole thing. You have to come and get in this ark. And they said, what's rain? What's an ark? We've never heard of it. This is hilarious. You're such a funny guy, Noah. And then God's wrath comes. And when God's wrath comes, no one is laughing on that day. And see, we find ourselves today as Christians in the same line as Noah and Lot because We've been charged with telling the world the gospel message, but uh, as much as the gospel is good news, there is a word of warning, and the gospel is there not. A, a word of impending judgment all, that all those who choose to remain in their sin, who reject the gospel of God, who reject the mercy of God, the love of God, who refuse to bow the knee to God, they will suffer the wrath of God throughout all eternity. And if you say that to someone today, how do they respond? crazy religious nut. I mean, they think you're just some crazy person. I mean, you, we literally have a message from the Lord, just like Noah had, just like Lot had. We have a message from God. It's like God told Jonah, you know, hey, go tell Nineveh, 40 days and this place is coming down. At least the Ninevites repented, you know. We have a word from the Lord saying, hey, Whoever knows how long it's going to be, one day Jesus is going to return and this place is going to be exposed. God's going to burn and purify this earth. I mean, God's wrath is going to be poured out. Just read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says that Jesus literally pours out the wrath of God on all those who refuse to believe the gospel. And you say that to someone today and they think, you're hilarious. You're such a nut. Uh, I had a guy at Lowe's literally tell me once, it's like a backhanded compliment. He said, I can't believe someone so smart can believe someone or something so dumb. I was like, thank you? <laughs> I don't know how to reply. How can someone so smart believe something so dumb? And I'm like, brother, this is not dumb. This is the future. <laughs> like, This is what is going to happen. And, and so we're not very different from what's happening here in this situation. We like to think we're pretty far removed, but this is the exact picture of what's going on today. So then look very quickly at verses 15 through 22. This is what happens next. It says, as morning dawned, so the night has passed, a new day has come. You think, oh, it's peaceful, nothing bad happened, but let's keep reading. The angels urged Lot saying, up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. And, and as they brought, out, brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back. That's going to be important later. Or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But, but here's the problem. But I can't escape to the hills lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was Zoar. Now, here's my question to you, astute Bible reader. Why is this scene here? This short little scene, I mean, just a, a couple of verses, 
what, what's the purpose of this little scene? Shows God's mercy. Okay. Anybody else have anything? It, that's right. right um what about this why why this conversation with with lot and the angel and the stuff about the like why is that important why why not just say and, and lot and his family left the city and they camped at zoar for a little bit and, and then they went somewhere what's the purpose of this why what's going on here okay yeah yeah i think you're on the right track so so not fully obeying the command Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it, it says uh, that, that they, they grabbed him. Yeah, they took him by the hand, uh, and, and they grabbed him and brought him out. Notice uh, back in verse 16, it said that Lot was lingering in Sodom. So he's not very quick. You know, the night before he had been quick. Hey, sons and law, you got to get out. You got to move. You got to get out of here. Now Lot, he's lingering in the city. That's right. <laughs> so here's something interesting. And, and I, I didn't put a Hebrew word up here tonight. That's the, okay, I'll do it. So I won't point it. That, that's for you. No vowel pointing. This is the Hebrew word Zoar. And uh, what is interesting about this word is, as you can tell, the city is called Zoar because it's a, a little city or insignificant. And, and did you notice, so not only did Lot linger in Sodom, but he makes a case. He says, can I, can I just go to that city? Uh, because it, it's just a little city, and, and I don't have time to make it to the hills. Notice, uh, Lot believed that God was sovereign enough to make sure he made it out of Sodom okay, but he didn't know that God was sovereign enough to make sure he got to the hills, okay? Uh, so Lot has a pretty small view of God, I think. And, and so he's lingering in Sodom. Then he says, hey, can I, just, can I go to that city? It's just a little one. He sounds like a child pleading with a, a mother. I, I used to do this with my mom all the time. Notice what he's saying. I want to go to that city. It's a little one. And then he keeps making his case. And he's like, you know, uh, you're good and merciful. I've won your favor. I appreciate that, but we can't make it to the hills. And after all, it's, it's just a little city. Does it not sound like a child pleading with a mom? I mean, I can remember instances, and they, they tell you in sales, you know, uh, once you've made the sale, don't keep trying to sell. You know, just cut it off. Like, they were going to agree to the city, but he keeps trying to sell it. He's like, you know, after all, it's just a little city. And mom, can we get a puppy? Let me tell you all, we'd be responsible, and it would teach me all these valuable lessons, and we would do this, and it'd be cute. And mom, it would make me responsible. Can we get a puppy, please? I mean, that's what Lot's sounding like here. But there's actually something really depraved going on. Do you know anything about Zoar? Anybody know anything about Zoar? Very good. Okay, so remember, and we remember this from, from earlier in Genesis, especially uh, Genesis, uh, what was it, chapter 14, when you remember Abraham went out to war against the, the five kings, and there were the five kings of the city there, or, or the cities of the valley. So remember, there were five cities in the valley, and this one, this tiny little city, Zoar, was one that was close to Sodom. And make sure we remember that God is going to destroy all the cities of the valley. That's what we're going to learn, except for Zoar. He's going to spare it because of Lot. Which means, if, if God's going to destroy these cities, what does it mean about these cities? They're all the same. They're all just like Sodom. And, and so basically, what, what, what Lot has done is he's saying, let me leave a big Sodom, and I'll just go to a little Sodom. What's the big deal, God? It, well, it's just a little city. I mean, what's the harm there, right? It's not as bad as it's this place. I get it. You're going to bring this one down, but what's so bad with that? And, and, and what amazes me is we think this is kind of funny, and we're like, oh, that lot. You know, he basically he can't leave Sodom. He's so ingrained in this sin. If he can't stay in the main place, he wants to go to a place just like it. That's how much he loves this place. And what it, it would be funny if it wasn't for the fact that we do this all the time. 
I, I don't commit those big sins. I don't murder anyone. I haven't cheated on my wife. These, these little sins, I mean, does God really care about like a little white lie here or there? Does he care about this or that? I mean, it, we, we kind of treat it like it would be like giving up crystal meth for marijuana and going, well, I'm okay now. I was addicted to crystal meth. I'm on marijuana now. Surely God's going to understand and, and I'm going to be good. We do this all the time. We think Lot might be ridiculous. He's, he's just wanting to go to a little Sodom. But folks, notice it's the enticement of sin and the hold that sin has on him. And we do it all the time. We, we will think that we're good in the eyes of God so long as we aren't committing what we have already judged to be the big sin, right? We're the ones who ultimately decide what the big sins are. So as long as I don't do these, then I'm good with God, but I'll be widely participant in all these little sins. We're not very far from, from Lot here. And, and so I just want to very quickly, as we're concluding, let's, let's read verses 23 through 26. Well, but before we do, just something to touch on what Miss Vicky said and what Lorraine said about God's mercy. Uh, notice here that Lot is ultimately spared. So he does want to go to a little Sodom, and yet God doesn't kill him dead immediately. He still saves him and rescues him. And we learn once again throughout Genesis and what we learn throughout the entire Bible that salvation is not earned by our merits, but salvation comes about by the mercy of God. No one here deserves to be saved. Any, does anyone feel like they deserve to be saved? No, of course not. I don't deserve to be in the presence of God forever, but I will be because of his mercy and his grace. Same thing we're seeing with Lot here. So look at verses 23 to 26 very quickly. So the sun had risen on the earth when the Lot came to Zoar. Uh, then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And so we see that the Lord finally destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. But here's my question. What are we to learn from this little statement about Lot's wife looking back? What's the purpose? She is what now? Yes. Yes, she doesn't want to leave. So she, uh, she turns back. So it, here's, okay, here's another question. They're on their way. They're running to, to Zoar. They make it to Zoar. And, and let's say rather than Lot's wife looking back, it was Lot that looked back. What would have happened then? And his daughters? So any, what, they're on their way. Let's, yeah, let's do it like this. Here's another one, okay? They're on their way. They're running. They make it to Zoar. And as they get to Zoar, they hear a noise behind them. They turn around. Oh, no, they accidentally see the destruction. Pillar of salt. So, okay. So is the sin looking behind them, or is it something else? To, to see, okay. Yeah, that's another good point. She, uh, it might have indicated that they didn't really believe God was going to destroy it, and so they wanted to see it happen for themselves. Um, it's, it's interesting. I could have put this up on the board. I didn't. Um, the phrase in Hebrew, it, it seems to indicate, it's not just that they turned around, but that she stopped following Lot altogether, that Lot almost continued on without her, and that she turned around, and not that she just looked, but that she was actually walking back to Sodom. And there's actually a New Testament passage that validates this interpretation. This is Jesus. So let's let him interpret the Old Testament. I trust his interpretation way more than any of ours. Jesus in Luke chapter 17, verses 28 through 32. And this is talking about the coming of the kingdom. And this is what Jesus says. Uh, Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, 
They were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. Uh, But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, listen to how people are going to respond on that day, okay? On that day, uh, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. So you have a person who's on a housetop and they know they have goods in the house and this person's reaction to Jesus returning is, let me go and collect all my goods. And so they return to do that. Jesus says, no, absolutely not. He continues, likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back, verse 32, very short verse in the Bible, remember Lot's wife. So Jesus is seeming to indicate that in the same way a person goes from the housetop back into the house to collect their goods, and in the same way a person might be in the field and return back home, the coming of the Lord, so too he says, don't do that, remember Lot's wife. Because she didn't just turn around and see, she stopped following Lot, And she turned around with the intention of going back to Sodom. Her heart was tied to Sodom. And in fact, uh, many people believe that she was from Sodom herself because there's no mention of her before Lot arrives in Sodom. And so she is just ingrained in this culture. She is ingrained in this society. She loves what the people have done there. She's grown accustomed to it. And when this finally going to be destroyed and she's been delivered, she turns back. I mean, it just, just think about that and how it relates to the gospel message today. Uh, people can hear, even after they hear the, the, the gospel message, right? You, you give them the message of salvation. You say, all you have to do is turn from your sins, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You'll be delivered from God's wrath. You'll be free from judgment. This is the message of salvation in life. And people can hear that and say, It sounds interesting. It sounds nice. I might attend a church service or two. I might continue that for a while. But eventually that old lifestyle is going to call me back and I am going to go. It's exactly what you see in Sodom here. They've heard the good news. Lot and his wife, they've heard it. They're running. They, They are experiencing some sort of temporary deliverance. And yet when they see the city burn, she just wants to go back. And so she becomes a pillar of salt. Uh... It is not like you see in some of these Bible movies where she turns around and all of a sudden, starting with the feet or maybe the head, if they're super dramatic, she just turns into salt. Uh, Actually, the way it's written in the Hebrew is like she turned around and because there was sulfur and fire coming down, there would have been a lot of ash and other uh, gases and chemicals involved in that, that that all came upon her and the result was it basically engulfed her in these chemicals and she became a, a salt pillar. And what's really interesting is The word used here for salt is literally the name of the Dead Sea. Uh, The Dead Sea is literally just called the Sea of Salt in Hebrew. It's the same word used here. And if you look at pictures of the Dead Sea, there's a bunch of salt pillars all around. And so basically people saw what happened to Lot's wife and they said, oh, that looks like the pillars of salt that you would see at the Dead Sea. And really interesting, there is a particular pillar of salt at the Dead Sea that looks like a, a human woman looking out and they've, they've called it Lot's wife. Uh, you can Google this image. It's very interesting. But this is the fate of Lot's wife. And uh, let's just read very quickly the last couple verses here, t- verses 27 to 29, as we conclude. And it says, And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where uh, he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. And and folks, I will say this as a quick concluding word. If if you want to write down some Bible passages to read, uh, you can read Jude chapter 1 verse 7. There's only one chapter in Jude. Uh, you can read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, and you can read Luke chapter 17 that we just referenced a, a minute ago. Uh, and, and you can uh, go on to 2 Peter 2, 9, Jude 5, all these Bible verses. Go and look these up later because what you need to see is consistently throughout the Bible, uh, the New Testament, we, remember, we're reading the Old Testament in light of the New, okay? 
And the New Testament says that this event is a foreshadow of what is going to happen at the end, the final judgment, when Jesus will return and pour out his wrath upon those who reject the gospel message. Uh, Peter says this, Jude says this, Jesus says this. This is a picture of what God does to those who indulge in sin because God hates sin. And everyone who didn't believe this message and who rejected the word of God, they suffered in the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and so it will be at the end. Everyone who has rejected the gospel, will, they will suffer the same fate of God's wrath. And the only way of rescue is what? Grace, Jesus, mercy, all of it combined together in the person of Jesus Christ, the gospel message that, yes, we deserve that destruction just like Sodom and Gomorrah. I think everybody in here would say, yes, we deserve that too. That is what we deserve for our sin and our lives. That should be our fate. And yet the way in which we can escape that, like Lot, is not because we're worthy. It's not because of our merits. It's not because of something we've done. It's because we have an intercessor, Jesus, who is greater than Abraham, who was trying to intercede for the people. And Jesus paid for our sins. And through faith in him, his life, his death, his resurrection, we will escape the judgment and be welcomed into glory where we spend eternity with God. This is an important passage for our world today. People think, oh, it's Old Testament. And, and yeah, it is. But it has bearing on our lives today. And I need people to see that and understand that. We don't have time to get into it. We're going to conclude. But especially think about things like this, about how sin constantly has this tie to us. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 7 to talk about indwelling sin and how sin has always had this hold on us. And we want to go back to it even as believers, just like Lot. And so what we need to see is that we should cut off sin. As my favorite theologian of all time, John Owen, said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. That is the goal of believers. Our lives are meant to be mortifying, killing sin in our lives because God hates sin, and so should we. Okay, any final words, anything you want to say? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I wondered that too because if you remember, God said in uh, chapter 18 when he's talking with Abraham, he literally said uh, almost the same thing and it was back in yeah, verse, verse 20 where he talks about the, the, the outcry being so great and it has come to him uh, very grave. So I'm not sure. The, the great cloud, uh, I believe, there was a great, yes, um, there were a couple who preceded Abraham. It would have been a smaller cloud, but nonetheless, it would have been there. Could, sure. Um, what, my off the, so off the noggin, this is just my attempt. First thing I would say is, I wouldn't say, so this is the best I can do. But I would be inclined to an angelic view um, simply because uh, you look at an instance like uh, the book of Job and how Job starts in, in chapter 1 and all the angels assemble before the Lord and, and the Lord specifically asks Satan, uh, where have you been? And he says, I've been walking the earth patrolling it, you know, seeing who has real faith and non-faith and all that, what they're doing. And they're bringing back this report to the Lord. So um, again, Bible doesn't say this is just my view, so take it with a grain of salt, but uh, it could be an angelic outcry, which is maybe also why he brings two angels. Because God doesn't really use two angels anywhere else in the Bible for this type of thing. God can be in the heavens and just snap his finger. He doesn't really have fingers, but you know what I mean. He could just say it and it would be done, and yet he used it. So maybe these two angels were the ones who brought, and so they're going to be the ones to deliver. I don't know, but uh, it would make sense. It's in accordance with the rest of the Bible. Well, it'd be the, the, an outcry about their many sins that they had participated in. So, there you go. All right, we're going to conclude in prayer because we're 10 minutes over. Sorry about that. And I'm going to ask Michael Stevenson, would you close us?